Hi, and welcome to episode number 80 of the EBPF and Cilium Office Hours live stream. I'm Liz Rice. I am streaming to you today from Zurich in Switzerland, where I have been uh, working with my team at ISO Valent. We've had a really good week getting together here in Zurich, uh, so hence a slightly different uh, virtual background today. And one of the reasons that uh, this week has been really exciting for us is that we were part of releasing Cilium 1.13. As always, if you're watching, do come and say hello. Let us know where you're watching from. It's always great to hear who's watching. And then I'm going to get back to telling you how exciting Cilium 1.13 is. I can see Quentin's joined us. Nice to see you, Quentin. Yeah, so 1.13 of Cilium was released just a couple of days ago and there are tons and tons of great features in it. Uh, there is a blog post that summarizes at all of these amazing features. There's lots of really great uh, tools in here and, and references, discussions, and even some uh, illustrations, videos. And I think if we go far enough down, we'll start seeing some examples and labs that you can uh, follow along, you can watch, you can understand how these different features uh, are going to help you in Cilium. It's something that's really exciting on the service mesh front is that we now have support for gateway API. So that's really cool. There's also a lot of different features in here that relate to integrating your Kubernetes network with external workloads. So uh, under networking, well, big TCP is, is really about um, being able to uh, handle really fast networking. Uh, VET replacement is an early part of improving the performance of Cilium. That's going to be really exciting to, to see that coming coming to fruition. So it's this is not uh, yet stable in 1.13, but uh, we're really excited about the progress we're making. IP address management for load balancer services and the ability to advertise service addresses on BGP. That's another really cool feature we've got added in here. Uh, there's just so much in here and some really nice videos. Here's an example of something where uh, folks have been putting together some really nice labs. NAT between IPv4 and v6. Pretty sure we covered this on an Echo episode fairly recently. Uh, that kind of does what it sounds like it does. It converts between uh, IPv4 and IPv6 addresses. And uh, what else do we have down here? We have... Lots of pictures of IPv6 networking. Oh, yeah, SCTP. So this is really used for streaming uh, streaming services. So that support is now in 1.13. And support for the Kubernetes internal traffic policy resource type has also been added. And... SRV6, I think we've mentioned SRV6 a few times in the context of telcos and uh, something that uh, folks from Bell Canada talked about. This is from EBPF Day. I guess this was at, uh, at Detroit. That's, um, so that's something that's been available for a while, but is now GA in 1.13. So that's a whole set of new features just in Cilium alone. So very um, proud to be just a small part of the team that's been uh, putting that together, that, you know, contributions from across the community going into that release. Another very cool thing that's happened on the Cilium project this week is that we've published the security audit and the fuzzing audit, both of which uh, were commissioned and, and, and paid for by the CNCF. So that's one of the benefits of being part of the CNCF family. Uh, folks at Ada Logics did both of these audits. Um, they did find some issues. 
very happy to, to, to say that they didn't find anything higher than uh, medium severity in the audit. So, um, you know, I think the, the team, you know, and over the years, people have been doing a really good job of uh, writing Cilium in a secure way. I'm sure there are still some vulnerabilities to find, but you can find all the details of what has been found and what's already been fixed in those audit reports. And then the last headline that I want to talk about is the upcoming CiliumCon is a co-located event with KubeCon in Amsterdam. That's going to be taking place the day before the, the main KubeCon events happen. I believe CiliumCon is going to be on the Tuesday morning. It's only half a day. We have had amazing set of submissions. I don't know how we're going to be able to pick amongst some of the, the really great submissions. I've had a, a, a sneak preview of the, the submissions so far. The program committee are in the process of reviewing those now. There's, there's some really high quality talks to, to hear from, particularly from, uh, from end users about their use of Cilium. So it's going to be a great event. If you haven't already, do sign up for CiliumCon, here we go, 18th of April in Amsterdam. If you're going to KubeCon, this is the co-located event to be at, of course. So that's all the headlines that I wanted to cover. And uh, so I think we can get started on the main topic for today. So I'm very pleased to be able to welcome Huamin Chen, who is a principal software engineer. And he's joining us today to talk about Kepler, which is a project that uses eBPF. As I understand it, it's using eBPF to measure energy usage that we can use that data to make our software, well, more energy efficient. We can understand where energy is being used and ultimately make our software more sustainable, right? Yes, at least you get it perfectly. Uh, so um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, friends of eBPF are everywhere and uh, love to see each other here. So as you said, Kepler is really about uh, sustainability and um, as consumption reduction, observation, uh, things like that. So we use an EPPF uh, in the same way um, as many people use in the community. So we probe the kernel functions, we get the performance counters, we get the information about the system, how system scheduling works. And then we're using this information together with the research that has been done in this area to find out what's the best way to estimate your energy consumption uh, in your workspace, especially in the cloud native environments. Meaning that if you are running on the Kubernetes environment, we give you some estimations about your part energy consumption or your namespace energy consumption. And we hopefully you can use this information in your software development, in your data center management, to find a way to identify the energy consumption consumers and take some actions to optimize your workloads, deployments and designs so you can be more sustainable. So that's the big picture. Uh, so this has I has been known for many years and many of the cutting edge technologies really need a community support and a community um, uh, uh, events like this. Uh, so I would uh, love to show you some of the uh, ideas that we use in Kepler. So the project was um, jointly developed between uh, uh, many multiple community participants, including Red Hat, IBM, Intel, and um, WeWorks, things like uh, people are very enthusiastic about these uh, prospects and they really wanted to make the sustainability work in their environment. Um, so let me just share my screen first. I must say, I'm very excited about the fact that people can measure their energy usage down to the granularity of the pod. That's going to be uh, pretty revolutionary. Thank you. We are trying to make our life easier. <laughs> I think right. at the moment it, it's going to show many instances of our ourselves, if I add that. The magic mirror. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll add it. And, yeah. Okay. I'll quickly switch over. Yeah, I think if you can... that looks a bit safer. Yeah, I'm okay. not quite sure what we're seeing, but uh, <laughs> safer. <laughs> we find the best way. All right. Um, so 
before we get up to the uh, uh, the details, uh, let me just give you a quick overview of the how the project works and what the problem is trying to uh, resolve and what the act uh, big picture look like. So um, doing slide mode. So when we run these cloud uh, native workloads, uh, we run on top of the shared systems. Hardware are being shared. Uh, CPU, memory, GPU, network storage. And uh, software are also being shared in this um, uh, operating system level. So you could have processes, which could be packaged as a containers. On top of a Kubernetes, you could have parts, different levels of granularity. Uh, this is the, uh, as the software developer, as a cluster admin, or as the end user, you want to have information about your workloads as different granularities especially when they are running these uh, shared environments that could have a uh, significant uh, isolation concerns, uh, uh, system configuration uh, uh, vari uh, variations. So how can we get the energy estimates using the best, best methodologies as we can in a transparent and uh, configurable way? So that's what's the, uh, the big picture that's capital want to address. The project started with the three principles or called them three R. The first R is reporting. So we want to report as part level energy consumption. The energy consumption comes from the CPU, GPU, RAM. We want to support both bare metal as well as the virtual machines uh, because at the end of the day, that's the environment most people will run into in their private data centers, in their public clouds. Uh, we support Prometheus, uh, that is the uh, Cloud native um, observation, observability, <laughs> observability infrastructure most people use. And we do not want to use a lot of system resources. That's where it defeats the purpose of uh, being sustainable. So we're using the cutting edge technologies, uh, EBPF, to reduce the overhead of consuming energies and resources in your system. As we measured, the user space uh, uh, capital application use usually be below 2% of the CPU and 40 megabytes of memory. So it's very efficient. Uh, we use so would that be 2% of the CPU? I mean, I, I guess it kind of depends what applications you're running, but if you're yes. essentially using 100% or virtually 100% of your CPU, 98% mm -hmm. is not, well, 2% is on the eBPF measurement. Some proportion is gonna be on the orchestration, the Kubernetes, and some exactly on your applications itself. Yeah. So yeah, the so two percent uh, is usually the upfront. Um, you know, most of the time, if you are those run anything, uh, the overhead will be very small. Um, so we do it in lots of ways. EBPF definitely is the big helper. So we love it. That's why we are friends. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the very last R is the regression. Uh, so we use the machine learning uh, models using different regressors uh, to estimate the energy consumption. So we do not invent the regressors. Uh, these are based on research that has been done in this area for many years. I just put one of the regression functions. That's a, I was, a, if you scan a QR code, one of the research papers uh, give some estimates how to, est uh, give some formulas how to estimate the energy consumption based on different CPU activities and uh, microarchitecture uh, inferences. So uh, if you look at the function, it really consists of the three components. One is the uh, idle energy, uh, the other one is active energy, the dynamic energy. The third one is uh, really related to the CPU architecture. On x86, mm -hmm. uh, normally if you run a single CPU instruction, it consists of multiple micro instructions. And these are only the information that you can get as the kernel space using the performance counter. Um, so that's why the eBPF is a big helper because once we are attached to the uh, kernel functions, we can also attach to the performance counters and we can get this information from there without a loss of overhead. Um, so certain other methodologies only take idle or dynamic into account, but in, ours, in our case, because we are using eBPF, we can get more information and give you more accurate estimates. I'm always using this uh, energy or uh, analogy as of uh, if you're running your uh, do a workout in um, you know full time, the yoga pose and the uh, treadmill use the different levels of your muscles. They consume energy differently. Even you are 100% busy, the energy consumption is not the same. So that's the idea. That's why EPPF is so powerful. It can give us the big picture, the broader picture 
of how the system works, and that can give you the real, uh, really uh, good estimates of your energy consumption. Um, so uh, this is a quick overview of the Kepler architecture. At the bottom of the, the layer, we use the eBPF to collect all these kernel information. Uh, once, once with the Kepler eBPF program, is attached to the kernel tracing program, a kernel uh, of task switch uh, function, is will take actions um, whenever a process is being swapped out, is take a snapshot of the CPU time, performance counters, and uh, the C groups, uh, the C group IDs and process IDs and a command, and also uh, relates the information to the second layer data aggregation relates to the user space view of what the process identity is and it correlates with some other counters. For example, the, uh, the hardware uh, monitors will give you a different set of uh, information, something like uh, the energy of information, something about C group, and also we also do CPU uh, measurements as well. So we correlate with all this information and push into the giant uh, machine learning models and using that models on the left side is the energy uh, we typically get from the uh, REPL, the Intel Energy uh, Register. On the right side is all its input parameters we get from EVPF, from a Linux operating system, and from uh, uh, hardware sensors. And then we get the estimates and we pro uh, produce these uh, Prometheus uh, metrics, and that metrics can be scraped and uh, displayed on the dashboard. So people can take a view and do also the background analytics to find out what is going on here and then take actions from there. So I guess um, a couple of things struck me on there. But one is really interesting to see cash misses, cash misses on there. Because mm -hmm. I guess, yeah, if you need to load a page of memory, that's going to take more energy than if... Right. Memory, yeah, that's, yeah, that's exactly kind right. of obvious, yeah. but like, it hadn't occurred to me. I think that's, that's yeah. pretty cool. Obviously. Um, so, you know, whenever we trigger some of the circuits, it's when you use some energy over there. So the more we can capture around the activities in the CPU, the better chance we can predict how much energy used by these processes. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And the other question I had is, I mean, it says there it's a Linux kernel trace point. Um, do mm -hmm. you have any um, insight into exactly where it's hooking into the Okay, kernel? that's my good uh, segue to the, uh, the program we are using, the EBPI okay. program we are using, yeah. Can you make so, that just a little bit bigger? Is that possible? Yeah, definitely. Lovely, thank you. Okay, so we attach, we use the kernel probe into the finish task switch function. Uh, so this is the function that has been called whenever a uh, process has been swapped out, a new process has been swapped in. Uh, so once we get into the function, we obviously get the process ID, we get the C group ID. Uh, so this is the process ID we get using the eBPF function. And we also use the same uh, similar C, uh, eBPF functions to get the C group ID. And then we get the timestamp, we get the CPU ID, and then we look up on the uh, CPU ID and the process ID to find out how much time this process is spent on the CPU. And on that CPU, we want to find out how many CPU cycles that has been running since last time we received it. And how many, mm -hmm. uh, this is also to use for the CPU uh, uh, cycles uh, calculation. Uh, so um, because the CPU cycles um, and the CPU frequencies are really, something that you can use for different uh, measurements of, a CPU, uh, of CPU energies. The, high, the rule of thumb is uh, the higher the frequency, the higher energy consumption it is. Just think about the treadmill uh, for the same instance. So if you are running five miles per hour and six miles per hour, the, en the amount of energy you spend on the treadmill is not the same. Uh, so we capture all this information and then we put this into the map. Uh, so see, we update all this map information and then we, in the user space capital program, we read from the map and then we update the user space views of what is going on as the kernel. And then we correlate with some other uh, information we collect at the operating system level and then give you the calculation of energy consumption. So that's what we use for this function. We also attach to the software IRQ function. So this is the function that's being called whenever a software IRQ is triggered. So as you know, the, there are many software IRQs around. I think there were 10 of them. 
Uh, some uh, uh, examples of these uh, IRQs include the block IO. So whenever a block IO is being triggered, it's uh, handled in IRQ context. And also network uh, TX and RX uh, IRQs are handled in the same way. So we want to capture this uh, networking and blocks device um, activities by going to the IRQs. Um, obviously, that's only applied to the applications that's using a, a kernel level uh, I/O and the network activities. If you're going to the user space bypass, this is probably not going to work. But again, if you're going to the user space, we have the CPU level uh, information. That's measured already. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Right. So this is the level of information we collect at the kernel level, and then let's see uh, we how we use the user space applications uh, to be eBPF libraries and to attach to the programs. So we're using I/O visor. Uh, Golan BCC library. Um, a little bit unfortunate. I know the IOVisor has a rich uh, libraries of uh, eBPF tools and um, helper functions. A little bit unfortunate is the Golan libraries are not updated very frequently. So we have to hack some of the functions ourselves and we try to upstream them, uh, but it's not has happened. It has not been merged yet. So you have a shout out to the IOVisor community if you see our PR, please take a look. <laughs> yeah, I think um, there's there's quite a lot more momentum now uh, in the so under Cilium there's a there's a Go eBPF library and and I think eBPF developers who are using Go have a you know that they've kind of started to congregate more around mm -hmm. that library. Yes. So yeah, definitely. So it's nice to have the communities uh, um, around the UBPF and, uh, you know, pioneers like uh, IWISE and uh, the experience have provided their own um, functions and entry points to use mm. the development cycles and get more out of the kernel. Yeah, that's how we use uh, UBPF in this context. I just want to, the next one, I just give you some quick uh, uh, showcase of what we can see from the dashboard and from the Prometheus. Mm. So once Kepler is running, I have it running on my real machine. So if you see here, right. So I think again, it's a little bit small. If you can okay. increase I'm the font, that would be bigger. great. Thank you. Right. Okay. So this is a Kepler program. Um, you see it's running as a daemon set. Uh, so once it starts, it's ready to produce the matrix. And as you see from the, we can see from the Prometheus and the Grafana dashboard. Uh, in order to make this happen, I have to uh, pause forward. I have to pause forward um, the Prometheus entry point and the Grafana. And uh, we also have to do the tunneling so I can see from my Mac. I wish there was a day I can also run Kubernetes on Mac natively, so I have I don't have to run all this uh, tunneling and post forwarding. All right. So now we can see the metrics. All right. Uh, so this is the one of the metrics that we capture produces. Uh, it's a report the container level CPU core energy consumption measured in joules. And if you do the I rates, you can guess what, right? The measurements, the units on the Y axis is watts, and uh, on the Y axis, X axis is the time. So you see over time, the uh, certain parts using more energy than the others. Uh, so this is something we, we use the, uh, for convention. Anything that runs in outside of the Kubernetes workloads and the kernel, whether that is kernel processes or Kubernetes native processes, we classify them as a system process. So you see here, this spike is from the system processes, uh, all the OS and the Kubernetes helper for programs. It runs at as high as 90 watts and it's quickly drop off to uh, less than 10 watts. And then if you are seeing this uh, Grafana dashboards, uh, which use the Prometheus metrics, we can have a better use of uh, what's the energy consumption over time. So on the top panel, we see the part and process power consumptions. 
uh, across all the namespaces. So you can choose which namespace you want to see. Let us see if you want to choose the crypt system namespace. And then on this level, uh, you have the, um, this is still still running. I think the because it's post forwarding, it gets a little bit slow, right? So you see, uh, this is the uh, energy consumption by different components. I think the, um, some of the things that we do not show here, uh, we usually put, break them down into CPU, G, uh, DRAM, and GPU. And on the right side, you see these are programs um, that mean energy consumption over time. So scheduler takes like a two watts, and the, the SDD takes about 0.16 watts. Uh, so this is the some of the information you, uh, for you to see. Uh, this is the actually components level. So DRAM um, uh, package it likes the whole CPU package, but DRAM and others. And if you can scroll down, you can see by namespace um, how much things you can see because there was a single names a uh, single node on my laptop. So this does not show anything beyond that. Uh, so that's what the dashboard looks like. If we let's just run a workload and see mm. how much energy is used by that workload. Let's refresh it. Okay. So the workload is actually also on the capital repo. It's for early valid for quick validation. Um, Do you publish those Grafana dashboards as well? Yes, they are also are in the Kepler um, repo. And quick, maybe you can share, share the repo quickly, so we know what we are talking about. So the Kepler repo, uh, as least kindly put on the uh, HackMD, uh, this is the location. The Grafana dashboard is located here. So you just need to import the Grafana dashboard. The caveat is that you need to access the data source. Uh, correctly, is um, if you are running Prometheus, this is a place you set Prometheus. If you create other data source names using that data source name, and uh, the the test is located in the manifest. There's a CPU test. Uh, let's quickly go through this uh, test. It uh, runs two replicas, and uh, the replica itself, as you see, is just cast the random. Uh, is a random for a number generator, we just cut it. And that's just keep you keep the CPU busy. And if you run two duplicates, you potentially can keep two CPUs busy. Right, so let's run this. Uh, right, so now the That is running. Uh, let's go to the dashboard. Uh, the dashboard has uh, some latency. So if you just refresh it now, okay, it's uh, showing up. So oh, the yeah. part, yeah. So the two parts are running. Um, the mean power is two point three one, uh, two like two watts. Uh, let's just uh, keep it running again. Yeah, that basically shows um, uh, what uh, the typical the UI look like and what's the process. And if you start the part, you look at it, see the numbers, and you some, some some sense how much energy used on the CPU package, on a DRAM, and things like that. Um, so there's a lot of things going on in the projects. Uh, as you see, this is uh, really based on a lot of technologies. So we use machine learning, we use eBPF. And we also actually based on lots of uh, academia research. As you see, uh, contributors to these uh, projects, uh, many of them come from IBM research. They based on their previous, uh, extensive previous research on this area. And we leveraged a lot on other people's uh, ideas as well, because this has been a very active research topics for many years. But ultimately uh, we unlock the values of this research by putting it into a pragmatic, programs using latest technologies, uh, machine learning as well as the EPPF and also cloud native environments. We will unlock these research values, make it, uh, um, make it affordable and accessible by the end users. Uh, so that is all about what I want to say for today. And thank you Liz for these opportunities. And uh, hopefully people around the world 
So sustainability levels, but you have to grow the community stronger and uh, bigger. We submitted a capital for CNCF sandbox, but at least mm -hmm. I know you used to be in the TLC. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we uh, we hopefully can make it is uh, more CNCF um, uh, centric and we'll see more contributors from this uh, environment as well. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. One question I have is, I mean, there's obviously research that correlates, you know, the the, the CPU, the memory activity, what have you, to energy usage. Mm -hmm. Is there also research or advice? You know, for people who, you know, if you find that your workload is really energy um, intensive, right. what can you do to, you know, to fix it, to make it more efficient? Are there like yeah. software coding guidelines? Yes, that's a very good idea. Uh, so obviously, use as little resource as possible. Uh, you can have the uh, right way, you know, because so light way is so efficient. You don't have to have a lot of contact switches. And things can be done in a very elegant way. So the programming models definitely makes a difference. Um, uh, the, for example, uh, the other example is the software architecture. The microservices, the transition from monolithic to microservices and to serverless, that also helps a lot. So the scalability. Does it? Yeah. That's, it's, oh, that's really interesting because I think, you know, my my intuition would be that a monolith would be you know, there are lots of reasons why I think microservices are better, but my intuition yeah. would be that there would be kind of more inter-service communication and maybe that would be increase the energy usage, but perhaps that's completely wrong. Oh, you can, it depends on how you see it. Uh, so the idea is that uh, more analytics, uh, because so many things run um, uh, together, yes, uh, the way you scale down and up will be very hard. And like microservices, uh, you can scale up and down uh, resources on, on demand. So that's why this is, uh, in many ways, is more scalable and more uh, resource efficient than monolithic applications. And the that's other really way, so it's the scaling, it's the dynamic scaling, the, scaling. And the, the right sizing of your different services. Okay, that makes sense. Yes. Yeah. And the other way is the hardware technologies. Uh, for example, if you are running this uh, CPU frequency scaling, if you are running as higher frequency versus lower frequency, you actually consume more CPU. But on the other side, if you're running higher frequency, the chances your program gets uh, finished early is much mm -hmm. higher than if you're a slow frequency. Whether that's it depends on whether you are CPU bound. So the KubeCon talk we gave as the um, last year as a North American uh, KubeCon North American talk we gave is that how can we balance ourselves between a CPU frequency and a CPU resource? Such that your um, you know, quality of service is guaranteed, but your energy consumption will be less because we allow the frequency, so the potential energy consumption will be less. So you have to use when you're treadmill, if you run three miles per hour, per hour, but you run for two hours, it does the same as you run six miles per hour, but for just one hour. The distance is the same, but the energy consumption will be much less because the intensity is lower. <laughs> so there are going to be a lot of uh, uh, things we can explore once we see the energy consumption in front of us. So that's why the capital is going to be the enabler for many innovations in cloud native era. That's really great. And the, the talk that you referred to, there's a link to that in the show notes, which are in the HackMD. Yes, in the show is, notes. Down there, <laughs> HackMD link is, is in that corner of the, yeah. of the screen. <laughs> um, yeah, another question that I, I wonder about is, does the choice of programming language make a lot? I, I would imagine that a mm -hmm. compiled language would be more efficient than a uh, than an interpreted language. Yeah, I believe so. Um, that's um, I have I know I have read a lot of uh, 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 news and uh, research papers. So the more um, you know, more compact, compact, and more native languages usually delivers the better energy and energy uh, optimization. So if you're running a highly packed, a highly loose language, I, I don't know what's the better, better word to describe that, or maybe bloated uh, language, then the potential that you are using more resource is higher. And that translates to energy as well. Mm -hmm. That's Thanks also- watching. To... Oh, sorry, go ahead. Okay, so go ahead. I just want to hire your question first. Yeah, no, I was just going to uh, ask the folks who are watching if you've got questions about Kepler or its use of EBPF, now is a good time to start typing them in and uh, let us know what 
you know, what you're curious about, about uh, measuring the efficiency of software, the energy use of software. Yeah. Well, I mean, I you, were, sorry, you were saying, so yeah. I can go to the questions. Yeah, I don't. I, okay. Uh, all right. right now? <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think um, the programming language uh, is going to be a huge topic for the future for sustainability. You know, just like the way we talk about the microservice transitions, these are the transitions at the architecture level, but at the programming level, there could be many other innovations as well. You know, nowadays people are talking about how Rust becomes so robust as well, so compact because it does not use a lot of a bloated um, um, runtime to mm. get it started. So this could be one of those directions people can explore. That's uh, if uh, certain program for certain task, if you run research in this language versus on other language, you whether you can save any energy. Again, I want to promote Kepler into this, this picture is that uh, Kepler can help you if you're writing program and run a workload, Kepler can help you to get the energy consumption and then you can reinforce your um, you know, approach uh, programming development cycles using the Kepler metrics to help you. Can I do more of this programming language or can I do more of this architectural design? So which way we are giving you better energy consumption over time. So it seems like Kepler already, you know, gives you a really good picture of the energy consumption. What's what's next? What's what's the sort of next developments you'd like to make in Kepler? Yeah, we want it more portable, more more accessible. Uh, so Kepler is right now depends on a lot of things. Uh, it runs on Linux. It uh, depends on ex expects a lot of um, uh, performance counters. Uh, expects a lot of uh, open system things. Can we port this to Mac, for example? <laughs> Can we port yeah. this to Windows? Uh, I know Windows has a UBPF library. Uh, it's supported by uh, the iOS folks. Mac, we don't know yet. So, so the more we see energy metrics, the better chance we can make things happen. Just like the way we look at our cell phone bills, now we know which vendor we should choose. The same mm -hmm. idea we apply. Seeing is believing, and seeing something will give you the direction as well as the motivation to try something hard. So we do like the community and the people who have expertise in those areas to help us to grow the technology, to grow the presence, and to make sure that some well, software developers, the end users, they can see the numbers. Once they see the numbers, the innovations can happen. And and yeah, what are your uh, sort of ambitions in terms of adoption? Like, and and have you got uh, you know users already? telling you about their successes with, with using Kepler to measure their energy use? Yeah, um, well, we got uh, uh, people who are in different industries uh, approaching the projects and evaluate, evaluating Kepler at different times. I think the, that is good news here um, because when we started the project last year, it's almost silent and most of us just developers. Now come to the end of the last year and the beginning of this year, we got some more and more responses and um, suggestions how we, what we should do, what we should do, and how we can help them to solve their data center or business cases. But this is a very good sign that we are coming to the realization, the revolution that people believe that um, energy consumption optimization is the right thing to do, both for their business and for the environment. So my ambition in this area is that. Uh, Cast the board out, make Kepler, uh, um, improve the projects, uh, make sure that Kepler can help people work in, in their working environment and save the energy, make their data center greener and for our future generations and, uh, as well. So um, the, obviously to achieve that goal, we have to have multiple mini milestones. The CNCF sandboxing is the one of the mini milestones we hopefully can achieve um, by you know, near future. And you know, the, uh, the long term future is we grow more presence, we support some more ecosystems and make it more usable. So that's hopefully can answer your question. Yeah, yeah. I guess the next question is if people see this project and they're really excited by it, I mean, obviously they can use it, but what, mm -hmm. what other ways can they get involved? Yeah, so this is a, uh, um, you know, I do see some of the and users, um, and they have this, uh, uh, they ask this question. 
can Kepler help me to tell me bigger than just the workloads, uh, energy consumption? If I have a multi-tenant service, can you tell me which tenants consume how much energy? So towards that direction, um, I'm also going to promote my QCAM EU talk uh, in the April. We are giving you some of the overviews how that could happen. Uh, so we use in the, you know, obviously because it's a QCAM, we use in CNC project Rook as one of the examples. If you have a multi-tenant uh, S3 interface, IGW, and how can you tell me which can tenants consumes how much energy? Uh, so we are giving you some high level uh, views about um, the, to answer these questions, how, how we can make that happen. And that principle can apply to different environments. So if you are, for example, uh, I'm using another analogy. So if you have a shared family plan, cell phone shared family plan, you want to know who is your family using the most of the data. <laughs> um, you do not want to use byte by bytes, minutes by minutes. You want to tell me how much you use in the most of the bill. This is probably loss is we are up to um, this is that energy analogy. Um so um so, so stay tuned. Um come to our QCAM talk. It's coming in two months, and hopefully that's also be the time I can meet you and Liz um again after three years. I know it's it's gonna be great. Everybody will be in Amsterdam and uh, right. yeah, it's it's <laughs> Yeah, it's it's exciting that we're able to do in-person events again. So yeah, yes, exactly. really looking forward to it. And mm -hmm. I guess one of the thought I have is that, you know, that, that idea of which of my tenants is using the most energy, it probably also correlates to which of my tenants is costing a lot. Mm -hmm. you know? So yeah. maybe there's some, you know, um, collaboration with some of those FinOps type uh Right. projects that, that you know this can tie in with because people you know people like the idea of saving energy and obviously you know uh, sustainability and energy consumption is, is hugely important right but also people are focusing on the bottom line quite often and, and being <laughs> able to sort of tie those two things together i think is uh, yeah you know, yeah definitely you know um, for success yeah. Right, that is a success. Is definitely the, the goal we want to help people to achieve, and uh, and it becomes so bigger now. Uh, just for reference, the utility bill um, in my house gets thirty percent higher than last year because of the pricing mm. difference. Uh, so people yeah. will see the energy will bite into their profitability. They will take actions, and that's actually positively influenced the sustainability uh, efforts that has been doing. Uh, going on for many years and it's towards the bigger, better and bigger and better future. Hopefully we can use it, you know, do a little bit now and then to make that happen. Mm. Mm. Totally makes sense. Yeah, so right. EBPF, good thing. Programming language, nice thing. Tesla hopefully can make people aware of all these benefits. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's fascinating to see EBPF being put to this this use i think uh, that's that's really great really really good to see it contributing to to the green and sustainability efforts that's really good thank you fantastic so i'm just going to say thank you to everyone who's been watching i can see that we've been pretty quiet today everyone I, I don't know where you're watching from so uh hopefully you are i can see the the numbers so i know you're out there <laughs> so um, but if you do have any questions, you, you know, this will be on YouTube. So you can always add comments onto the YouTube. And I mean, you have the excellent Twitter handle of RootFS, which I think is really, <laughs> really, really I, good. I have the advantage of being an earlier GitHub user, I guess, the handle. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for sharing your, you know, your knowledge of Kepler and for showing us uh, the demo today. It's been really interesting. And, it's all my pleasure. Uh, yeah, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you in Amsterdam. And hopefully everyone who's watching will join us at CidiumCon. All right. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Bye.